All right, I'm Suzanne Tuttle. Welcome everybody and thank you for attending tonight's presentation about the Native Prairies Association of Texas's Prairie Seekers program. The Prairie Seekers program, which actually Michelle Villafranca, who is also on the call tonight, she played a very big role in putting this program together. It's a um, semi-quantitative assessment and mapping program that's based to some degree on the Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, I can't remember now exactly what the term is that they use, but their natural heritage program assessments of locations. And what we were finding as prairie lovers is, as y'all are well aware, the prairie is disappearing around the Dallas-Fort Worth at a, really an astonishing rate. And we were hoping that by giving our members and even non-members the tools that they needed to, to recognize a really nice prairie um, that we might be able to start a conversation with landowners or developers about conserving more prairie remnants before they're all developed. So um, this program was actually put together by Michelle and Kate and I are um, contributing to it. And so I do hope that uh, Michelle and Kate will feel free to, to chime in if I miss something or you see something that needs to be added. So just as a review, and, and I feel pretty comfortable that everybody on this call is, is aware of where the prairies are in the North American continent, but just as a review, this is historic range of the different types of prairie across the midsection of the North American continent. Tall grass in pink, mixed grass in uh, this bluish gray color, and then uh, short grass in yellow across the um, front range, low rainfall areas right up next to the Rocky Mountains. And as you can see from this, True Prairie covers a very large percentage of Texas. In fact, if you count the desert grasslands of the Big Bend area and the live oak savanna grasslands of the hill country, um, almost all of Texas is actually a grassland state with the exception of the deep East Texas piney woods. So this is a map of the soils of our area. And though I know most of y'all, if not all of y'all are very familiar with the plant communities and the soils of the North Central Texas area. And you can see by the soil map here, why we have such a complicated, intricate plant community in North Central Texas. So the vertisols, which are the heavy black clays that self-churn and do not create soil horizons, that's the blackland prairie. And this gray strip, that's the Austin chalk uh, formation that is almost bare white limestone. And then this little strip of lime green is eastern cross timbers. This pink mollusol soil is the Fort Worth or Grand Prairie. And then we get into Western Cross Timbers on the other side of the Fort Worth Prairie. Um, if you look at the next slide, this is soils. If you look at the next slide and you look at, this is actual plant communities, you see how closely the plant communities mirror the soil types, that's because the soil type is heavily influences what kind of plant community that combined with climate, rainfall, temperature range, that uh, heavily influences what actually will grow in any given location. So here is the map of our area with the Blackland Prairie, this black line demarcates, this is the Eastern Cross Timbers, the Fort Worth Prairie or the Grand Prairie. Um, the Fort Worth Prairie stops roughly here at the, I think that's the Bosque River. 
Yeah, I think that's the Bosque River. And then this part that stretches on down to what is uh, part of the land, the land passes or the limestone cut plain. And then this is the Western Cross Timbers. And this one little inclusion here is called the Carbonate Cross Timbers. And that's because this soil is actually limestone based. This is the Palo Pinto Mountains in essence. And this is limestone based, but it's much older limestone than the limestone that formed the Fort Worth Prairie and the Blackland Prairie. These prairies over here were formed on uh, Cretaceous era soil and the carbonate cross timbers is limestone that formed in Pennsylvanian era. So it's much, much older than, than our um, Fort Worth and Blackland Prairie limestone. So Suzanne, could I stop you and ask a question from yes, Marianne? Please. What's sure. the difference between savannas and prairies? Savannas are grasslands. They're actually, a, a, as a global um, ecoregion, they are grassland, but they have a certain percentage of uh, woody plants that shade the soil and typically in a savanna it's roughly about 25 or 35 percent of the ground is shaded by woody plants so um, the historic post oak savanna of the cross timbers would have had in general clumps of trees connected by large open expanses of grass and the other thing to remember when you're talking about ecoregions and a savanna is this that's on average 25 to 35%. In some areas, even in a savanna, you're gonna get like a closed canopy forest. You have to think about it on a very large scale, like 10,000 acres or some much larger scale than a five acre plot, for example. In our area, the true prairies um, historically only shaded, only had about 5% woody plants. And the savannas, 25 to 35 roughly, maybe up to even 50% in some places. Any other questions? That's all. Okay. So we're going to run through the different types of grasslands that we find in our area because we want, um, if you're interested in looking for grassland remnants in, in an area that you visit or an area where you live or an, or an area you travel between frequently, we want to make sure we cover the types of prairies that you're likely to encounter. Um, you're probably not very likely to encounter a remnant blackland prairie, unfortunately, because only a very tiny percent of the blackland prairie remains that has not been converted to some other use. And that was because the blackland prairie was pretty level, easy, easy to build on from a topography standpoint, but also it was very, very productive for crops. And so it was it was converted to agriculture almost exclusively very early in European settlement. And um, the only little remnants typically that we find these days are spots that were a farmer's hay field that they would cut for hay for their livestock every year. That was the only thing that prevented them from plowing it because it was just so productive to plow blackland soil that was full of organic matter that had built up for eons, uh, all the prairie roots holding the, the soil together. And um, I'm not sure whose picture this is, but I love this picture. You can tell it's in the spring. This prairie celestials, isn't that really beautiful? So. Um, that was taken at Climber Meadow. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> that explains it, our best black man remnant. So the, that definitely explains that. So um, what are some signs of blackland prairie or soil that was blackland prairie plant community in the past? Well, you might find because of the heavy, high clay content of blackland soil, 
and how mobile it is. It cracks, it swells, it, it turns itself around because pieces fall into the cracks and then they just turn themselves around. You might find these mounds called Mima mounds and you might find Gilgai, which are little depressions. Um, and uh, what's really, really interesting to me about Gilgai is that they are destroyed by cultivation. And look at this picture. This looks like a golf ball. These are all Gilgai. But they actually will reform in a fairly short period of time geologically. Um, I have a friend who has 12 acres in Saxe on the Blackland Prairie. And it was an old cotton field and she raises horses. And so she's lived in that house for, and I don't know how many years the cotton field was fallow before she bought that property and built a house, but um, she has Gilgai in her pasture and she doesn't have Blackland Prairie um, plant community anymore, but she has Gilgai, it's reformed since the cropping was, um, was ended. So I just found that to be extremely interesting. These two nicknames, hog wallows and nooner soils, um, these depressions hold water and they create different ecosystems. So you've got a wetland essentially in the bottom of a Gilgai and you've got a little dry land prairie around the rim of the Gilgai. And uh, farmers called them hog wallows. They couldn't plow them before noon, but then after noon, they were too dry. So, so that's why they were called hog wallows and nooners. So moving to the Fort Worth Prairie, um, this is the prairie that I'm probably most familiar with because I spent 23 years working at the Fort Worth Nature Center and this is the type of prairie that we have in combination with Western Cross Timbers at the Fort Worth Nature Center. Um, this is a little limestone lens that's sandwiched between the eastern and the western cross timbers. And it's an extreme, it's a totally different soil type and it's, and it's a different plant community than the Blackland Prairie because the soil is much, much more shallow. And in fact, you get a lot of um, outcroppings of the, the limestone bedrock in the Fort Worth Prairie. So you, you get these plant communities called barrens that are very different. You can get a very high succession barren that has no tall grass on it at all. It's got very short plants that can survive living in the cracks of this limestone. This is a cross section of the way it looks underground in a Fort Worth prairie. Uh, all of these different layers were laid down when the Cretaceous in um, mid-continent seaway covered this area. So these, are, these represent different high water, low water episodes. And um, at the top of these hills where there's very uh, little soil and most of what was there is probably eroded off, you get barrens. And then water can percolate into the limestone until it reaches a hard pan layer It'll seep out and you get these areas called muley seeps where um, Muhlenbergia uh, seep muley grows. And that identifies exactly where that little wetland patch is. And then at the bottom or the foot of the slopes where soil has accumulated and it's deeper, you get tall grass prairie. So these are some examples of the different kinds of landscape you can see at the, on the Fort Worth Prairie. This is uh, the foot of a slope. This is a really, really nice remnant here. Um, we can see liatris, um, uh, pale yucca, yucca pallida, uh, lots of little blue stem. Little blue stem was by far the most common grass in a remnant, uh, according to research done back in the um, 1940s and 1930s by Dr. Uh, E.J. Dykstra-Heiss. He wrote a very good monograph about the vegetation of the Fort Worth Prairie and the vegetation of the Western Cross Timbers that's really valuable reading. 
So this is a good example. So if I saw this, if I went out to look at a, you know, do a Prairie Seekers evaluation and I saw this, I would get super excited. Here's a Barron's example. You can see bare soil, lot, it usually has lots of bare soil. Um, there's plants that, that somewhat define a Barron's. Usually you'll see pale yucca, which is a, an endemic. It's only found in a certain area of North Central Texas, and that's its entire global range. So if you see pale yucca on these thin limestone soils, you know you're, you're in a barren's site. Um, these really pretty yellow flowers, this is Whitlow wort. Um, Paranichia virginica, that's one of my favorite scientific names. I love the word paranichia. And this, I always see this only on good barren's limestone sites. And it's, it flowers in the fall. You can see the liatris is flowering. So it flowers about the same time as liatris. And this and um, uh, uh, Stelingia texana, the Texas Stelingia or the Prairie Queen's Delight, that's another one I typically find on these barren sites. So when you get out in the field often enough and you look at and you have the opportunity to compare good and not so good plant communities, then you start developing an eye for if you find this, that's a good sign. It's really exciting. You think, well, maybe then there's a lot more to it. And that's one of the things we're definitely going to be talking about and trying to develop in the field study on the 26th. Here's a really good picture of the seat. This is at the Fort Worth Nature Center, and I'm super familiar with this site. This is at the Oakmont Trail. This is called Farview Prairie. And see this band of different colored vegetation right across here where I'm dragging the cursor, that's a seep, that's seep muley. And you can spot it, oh my God, you can spot it from a quarter mile away. You can tell where there's a seep muley site and especially in the fall when the seep muley flowers and it's pink flowering heads and in the morning when the dew is on it, it's just like sparkly diamonds. It's so, so, so pretty. And so, so this gives you an indication of there's your hydrology. You've got water seeping out of that hillside. This is also a pretty common site on Fort Worth Prairie Barrens. Totally bare limestone and water seeping out of the limestone if it's a healthy site where there's actually still some good spring hydrology um, in action. And these are ephemeral typically. These will be really wet in the spring and the fall when we're getting some decent rain. And then in the summer, these will dry completely up. And so the plants that survive in this habitat, the same with the seat muley, really wet in the spring and fall, really dry in the summer. And so these plants have to have that capability of surviving inundation for a long period of time and then total drying out for a long period of time. Very impressive plant community. These are another few things you might find. Here's seat muley. See how beautiful this pink is? And it's a small muley. It's, um, it's only about calf high. It's not as tall as gulf muley. It actually makes a really nice landscape plant. Um, there's a couple of spike rush species, Heliochorus occulta and Monividensis, that are sort of indicative of Fort Worth Prairie and Prairie Barrens. And occulta is called occulta because it completely disappears until we get uh, wet periods in like the spring. And it'll suddenly just erupt and you'll have this like mustache of bright green little, little spike rush. And of course, here's our pale yucca. That's another species to look for when you're looking for an indicator of, an, of a place that might be of interest. These are some other species that are good indicators of Fort Worth Prairie uh, potential remnant sites. Engelman sage, white rosin weed, and summer gay feather. These are only found on Fort Worth Prairie. 
So if you find any of these on a site, it really bears additional investigation. Summer gay feathers, a brand new species that was identified. It, well, it's not even in the flora of North Central Texas from 1999. So it was identified in the 2000s as a separate species from the more common like Liatris macronata. This is Liatris estivalis or summer. Estivalis means summer. And this flowers in the summer, uh, typically in like July. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now moving into the cross timbers, um, this is a map showing where all these fingers of cross timbers lie in their its entire range up from Kansas through Oklahoma down into Texas. And again, here's the eastern cross timbers in Texas. They join together right around the Red River and then continue on up through Oklahoma and Kansas. Here's western cross timbers. And then here's that carbonate, which is limestone um, ash juniper woodland on Palo Pinto Mountains. So you can see um, what, what counties where these different plant communities lie. So savannas are at the forefront of the climate, climactic battle or climatic battle. And um, savannas, the, the actual boundaries of the savannas are very fluid because um, amounts of rainfall, temperature, even events like droughts and um, hail storms, freezes, they can affect the ability of woody plants to colonize an area. So you get this moving front of cross timbers moving into prairie and prairie and then the prairie will move back into the cross timbers when we get some hard years where the grasses do okay but the trees start to fade. Are there any other questions, Kate? I should stop talking so much and ask. Um, the only other question is, will the presentation be shared with us for further reference? We are recording it, so we can make it available. Yes, definitely. And that's all. Oh, okay. So here's a map that Dr. Dykstra Heist did in 1948 showing the two different kinds of western cross timbers. The gray he called the main belt and this black he called the fringe and then you've got this is the carbonate cross timbers here in the middle with the limestone soil and the ash juniper and the main belt is flatter and the soil is deeper where the fringe is very rocky and a lot of topography. If you've been out to Mineral Well State Park, all that penitentiary hollow rock formation, that's part of that fringe. That's really old sandstone, um, Pennsylvanian era sandstone. And so you can get some extremely old post oak trees, which we're not really talking about post oak trees, but they're extremely interesting um, on those fringe areas where the they were never farmed and they weren't really good for any kind of agriculture and the trees got really, really, really old. Here's a nice picture, I think, illustrating what I think the savannas probably look like more. Um, lots of, there's lots of mid-story. It wasn't just tall trees and grass. There's lots of understory and, and mid-story plants. And of course, this would burn regularly. And post oaks are very fire adapted. They have very thick bark. And so um, they, can, they can survive a pretty decent fire. And, um, but, and they also, you can see these limbs. A lot of times you can tell an area that's been burned because the limbs will have been burned off on the lower part of the trunk. So that's another indication of a fire uh, dependent landscape. These are some things to look for in the sandy soil because the cross timbers is very sandy soil. The prairies are limestone based so the soil's alkaline and it's got clay in it so it's thick and gummy. 
um, very gravelly in the Fort Worth Prairie. In the cross timbers, the basis for the soil is sand. So it's slightly acidic, about 6.5 pH, very loose and um, very poor in nutrients because the soil is so loose, everything just washes right through. But these are some good plants um, indicating that you're in cross timbers. Um, uh, purple top tridents, I never see that personally, I guess I should never say never, that's not good for a biologist to say because there's always an exception, but rarely, I, I can't think of a time I've ever seen purple top tridents in a prairie uh, or a, a limestone based soil. I always see it in sand. Glen Rose yucca, yucca necopina, it is an indicator of a very deep beach sand and it's a very rare plant. So if you find, this is a large yucca, it's not a bluish uh, green color like um, yucca pallida. It's a, it's a bright green color and uh, it's, very, it's large and it has threads like white threads coming off of the edges of its leaves where yucca pallida is, the edges of yucca pallida, the leaves are red and they don't have those threads. So, um, so just some ID tips. Spotted bee balm is a sand plant where the, the more commonly seen purple uh, lemon horse mint, which is a very close cousin, that's a clay. Um, so spotted bee balm you find on sand, butterfly milkweed you find on sand in our area. So we all know what threats are to our prairies, fencing, Woody invasion, lots of invasion by non-natives, agriculture. I mean, prairies are just beat up from every direction. It's the best place to develop. It's the best place to farm. Uh, fire suppression has been really hard on prairies because that really invigorated them. And settlement means fire suppression. Typically, obviously, no one wants their house or their property to burn down. Um, energy production, unfortunately, had became a big threat. Um, it seems to be kind of starting back up again. And of course, urbanization and just urban maintenance practices. I mean, there's really, this is, this is a no man's land for wildlife. You've got tall trees and you've got tiny short grass and where's, where's the habitat for wildlife? And then people not really understanding prairies or caring about them um, and not really being familiar with them, learning to love them. And I think that's where we can really make a difference is reaching out to people and trying to um, trying to show them just such what a wonderful ecosystem and a wonderful landscape a prairie is. And it's all full of surprises and, and hidden things that, that it's really fun to explore. So what can, what can we all do to help? Well, that's the point of the Prairie Seekers program. Um, let me bring up the, this form larger so that it's easier to see. Okay, everybody can see that, I hope. Um, so these are some of the things we look at. And this, this form is very convenient to use in the field. And like I said, Michelle and a number of other people worked really hard on this. And this has been um, field tested and a number of times and tweaked. But, um, you know, just you just go through and check boxes or fill in, um, fill in data. Are you just seeing something from a road? Uh, or are you actually on the property and able to walk around and get a better sense of the property? Are you taking photos? Are, you know, photos are extremely helpful. Um, photo points, like if you have a specific spot that you go back to and take photos from the same direction, same time of day, um, every week, every month or whatever. We used to do this a lot at the Nature Center after we would burn, we would have photo points so that we could track the recovery and what came up um, from, you know, after a burn. 
Uh, different kinds of surveys. Are you doing a step survey? So that's where you set up a, a line transect and you take, you, you know, you just, you take so many steps and then you uh, account for whatever you have right there at, at the end of your toe. And, and you, you continue that for a hundred steps, or you can do a circle survey. Um, where are you? Do you have GPS coordinates? How many acres, if you have any idea how many acres the site is, how do you get there? Who, do you know who owns it? Do you have any kind of connection with that person or people, or um, is this just a total cold call, so to speak? And then what kind of um, features are you seeing? Do you find Mima Mounds? Do you find Gilgai? Uh, is it a Barrens area? Where are you? You know, is it a cross timber site or is it a prairie site? Um, so it's just, this is what we're gonna be doing in the field out at LBJ Grasslands, going through and using this, um, these forms. So this, um, you wanna write what are the dominant grasses, forbs, that's a um, range management term for herbaceous plants that are not grasses. So in essence, it's the wildflowers. So uh, there's even a very uh, handy list of indicator species that if you find them, that's, that's an important, um, important to note because those can indicate, like so you have Engelmann sage on here. Baptisia, that's always good to find because it's a really high succession conservative um, P that's really important in prairies because the peas fertilize, self-fertilize the prairies. There's silphium, the gag feathers, um, different kinds of yuccas, different kinds of grasses that are uh, considered to be indicative of a particular type of prairie. Are there invasives? Are there woody species on your prairie? And then any kind of other activities? What are the threats? What kind of disturbances? What kind of public benefits does this piece of property have? And then we've got another form that, hang on. Let me bring that up. So if you run out of spaces to write down the different kinds, if, you know, say you find a really fantastic site and you run out of spaces to document what all great stuff there is there, there's an additional species form. So let me go back to the PowerPoint. So see in this, uh, in this picture, there's a silphium um, yellow compass plant. If I found that, I'd be super excited. Here's um, butterfly milkweed. And we have a Prairie Seeker project, right, Michelle, on iNaturalist. So if you're out doing prairie collections, you can log your sightings on iNaturalist if you use that, that platform. So here's the forms. We can organize field days to go out and as a collective do um, analyses. You know, we, we actually get calls uh, once in a while from landowners who actually are interested in knowing what they have on their property. And so there's a group of us that'll go out and, and, and um, see what they have and basically do a little mini prairie seekers for the property owners. And um, this is, this looks like a class. I know a number of these folks in this picture So here's yeah, some good, 
That was what? A grass ID class. Okay. So here's some books that we recommend. Uh, they're, they aren't plant ID books. They're really, except for the flora, they're really good books just for understanding and getting a better appreciation for grasses or just for prairies and grasslands. And I have most of these books myself and we'll bring them to the class on the 26th so you can see them close up. So that's it for the introduction to the Prairie Seeker program. Of course, um, getting out in the field is where it really is at.